Back when Mass Effect Legendary Edition dropped, I was actually writing a script for SFO about it. I figured it would be a good companion piece for the channel. Naomi and I are currently doing Mass Effect streams, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the game, more specifically its horrendous quality, but I realized there just wasn't enough wider scope stuff there that I hadn't already covered in my New Era of Moral Panic video. The Mass Effect relevant parts of that vid, by the way, are that back in 2007, when the Puritans of the religious right still held some cultural power, Fox News published a hit piece on the first Mass Effect game, complaining that Liara, a member of the alien, agender, asexually reproducing Asari species, was a romance option for both male and female players, and therefore the game included a blue booty lesbian sex scene. Well, not technically lesbian sex, as Liara is not technically a woman, but she looks like a woman and that's enough for human sensibilities to call the pairing lesbian. And hey, the Dorito Pope himself was part of that Fox News segment, making an impassioned plea on behalf of the game. This event spooked Bioware so much that in Mass Effect 2, the obviously bisexual character Jack had her female romance option taken out of the game, with the final version presenting Jack to still be bisexual, but not believing Shepard's advances are serious. That being said, the romance scenes, the voice lines, they did exist, they were recorded and created, but were ultimately left on the cutting room floor. And when Mass Effect Legendary Edition was announced, there was a rumor they were going to restore the romance, but it ended up not happening. I wouldn't have minded. It clearly fits Jack's character, but Mass Effect Legendary Edition is specifically meant to be a remaster of the original games as they existed a decade ago, flaws and all. I respect that. And then they nerfed Miranda's glorious, genetically engineered to be perfect ass. Well, not really. Rather, they adjusted the camera angles of scenes she was in so as not to objectify her. Okay, fair enough. It is ridiculous that in this scene, the camera's positioned in this location to get this angle. But if the argument for Jack is release the game as it was, why is this being changed? Maybe it's because it's easy to do and they didn't really want to put too much work into the game? Actually, yeah, that's exactly it. Because the remaster is also absolutely fucking ugly. It looks like they upscaled some textures, lazily slapped in a modern lighting engine, and called it a day. No fine tuning, no actual work to make sure things looked good or new components meshed, just shit it out into the stores to capitalize on the Mass Effect name. The original graphics do look dated, but they've got a unique style that the remaster completely ruins. Add to this that the game itself has been made a lot easier, with combat even on the insanity difficulty being dumbed down, and speech checks requiring a lot less reputation, and it turns out that Mass Effect Legendary Edition is a train wreck. But, is that enough for a whole video? I mean, I've already gone over all my gripes and we're only a few minutes in. Well, another similar culture war-esque footnote is the recent leaking of the Powerpuff Girls script. Powerpuff Girls was a cartoon about a kid superhero team from back in the 90s. The gimmick was that the girls were overly cute, specifically not sexualized, cute in the innocent way that kids are, and that despite that cuteness, they had powers on par with Superman and were tasked with fighting monsters and supervillains while also attending kindergarten. Because everything's getting rebooted nowadays, a modern Powerpuff Girls series was greenlit, and it turns out that the girls are now in their 20s. They're washed up. They're social media sex addict lesbians. An anime that was clearly meant to be, on some levels, a Powerpuff Girls parody, called Panty and Stalking, features super-powered high schoolers drawn in the same style, except in this show, they're sex addict degenerates. And them being in high school makes that at least slightly better than them being in kindergarten, but it's Japan. But nonetheless, this is a parody, and the Powerpuff Girls became their own parody! Not only that, but Mojo Jojo, whose entire character revolved around him being a hyper-intelligent monkey, who is iconic for the hyper-intelligent monkey trope, second only to the Planet of the Apes, in the new version has been made into a human. Professor X is now a black man, which is not that big of a deal on its own, but it turns out he was also an absentee father to the Powerpuff Girls as they grew older, and also that he stole Chemical X from Mojo Jojo, who was its real creator. I have no idea why, if you were gunning for woke diversity points, you would blackwash a character only to also make him a thief and a shitty dad. The leaked script was wildly ridiculed on the internet. The leaker was apparently fired and faced legal action. And for a short while, the production company was actually issuing DMCAs on Twitter, for all the good that's doing them because the script's everywhere now. And the head of CW, Mark Pedowitz, oh god, that's a terrible fucking name to be attached to this story, has vowed to scrap the pilot and get the script reworked, but the damage is already done. Again, there's an interesting story here, but I've just given you all the good bits, and I'm not the kind of person who feels comfortable artificially expanding a video's length out to 10 minutes when the story really doesn't deserve it. I was also writing a script on the recent Dalmatians train wreck, but I hit the same problem. It's not nothing, but it's not deserving of a video. The original 101 Dalmatians was the story of a songwriter and his dog, 
how they both meet their partners, man and dog alike, and how an old schoolmate, Carilla DeVille, ends up wanting the puppies of that pairing in order to make a fur coat. Ridiculous, unbelievable hijinks ensue, and due to the movie's success, Carilla DeVille became an iconic character, a symbol of greed and vanity. You don't need to have seen the movie to know what this character's all about. Her appearance tells us the story, but not only that, she's become that ingrained into our culture. In the new Dalmatians movie that just came out, Carilla DeVille's mother was killed by Dalmatians pushing her off a cliff. In fact, she's actually pro-fake fur this time around, she just really hates Dalmatians. In other words, it's really fucking stupid, but again, not worthy of a full video. So what exactly are we talking about today? Is this just a cynical attempt by me to combine a bunch of disparate scripts I've already written in order to recoup some of the work I've put into them, after I realize that while there is some meat on the bones of these stories, it's not nearly enough to qualify for their own videos? Well, yes. But it's not just that. Don't turn the video off. There's more to talk about. For a long time now, the phrase, get woke, go broke, has been tossed around, and sometimes with good reason. For example, Ghostbusters 2016 was such an egregious failure that Ghostbusters Afterlife is returning to the original canon and acting like the all-female alternate universe movie never happened, despite there being an obvious sequel hook at the end of the 2016 version. And back when that movie came out, YouTube was filled with tons of commentators talking about how shitty the movie was, how woke it was, how it was rad femme baiting and man-hating, how the jokes didn't work, how the acting was terrible, how talking about your vagina every sentence doesn't actually constitute character development. But most importantly of all, how Ghostbusters 2016 had assembled all of the pieces of Ghostbusters, but not into a Ghostbusters movie. Ghostbusters isn't flashy, impressive action sequences with strong, badass heroes blasting their proton packs. It's four idiots blowing hot air to a crowd about how they're going to save the city, and then slowly and impotently climbing the stairwell of the tower because the elevator's out. And for me personally, it was a lot of fun to see people who were highly invested in Ghostbusters 2016 screech that the fans wanted to return to the old canon and the studio was giving them what they wanted. Yes, it is like you never existed, and that's for the best, really. Get woke, go broke is a catchy, pithy phrase. And people who commonly use it point correctly at Ghostbusters 2016 as proof of its efficacy. But these same people often ignore all the times in which the phrase should apply, but actually doesn't. Consider the Captain Marvel movie. It sucks. The plot is functional enough to move us from scene to scene, but it's nothing to write home about. Captain Marvel as a character is overpowered, and her addition to the main Avengers storyline basically breaks it. Brie Larson isn't a great actress. But because it was part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it grossed $1.1 billion. And because it starred a strong female lead, however shitty she was, both on camera and off, it garnered woke support. In the same vein, consider the Star Wars sequel trilogy. They all suck, especially The Last Jedi. The plot of the whole trilogy is again functional, but nothing to write home about. The Last Jedi horrifically mangles its section of the story, causing the rise of Skywalker to have to rush through two movies in one. But as an overarching plot, it's just mediocre. Rey, like Captain Marvel, is a Mary Sue. And the other characters in the franchise are either underutilized or wholly mistreated. The new talent brought in for the roles aren't good actors or actresses. But again, because it's Star Wars, even the worst movie of the bunch, The Last Jedi, grossed $1.3 billion. And because it starred a strong female lead, it garnered woke support. You can point at the abject failure of the supplementary materials of these properties, like the toys, comics, and games, say, get woke, go broke with a smug on your face, and you'd still have a point. But at the end of the day, these stinkers still made money hand over fist. In fact, I think that's why some YouTubers ended up making, and in some cases still make, dozens of videos on Brie Larson or Kathleen Kennedy or Star Wars or Captain Marvel, because they're really banking on the get woke, go broke thing to be an ironclad rule. The more they can try and convince their audiences they're slowly winning a culture war, the better it is for their channels, even if they're actually losing that war, or even if, in this instance, such a war doesn't actually exist. Pop media, and therefore clickbait YouTube, is riddled with videos talking about reimaginations of old properties that are getting woke and will surely be going broke. And I'm not entirely innocent either. The she reboot, nicknamed Zira as a play on words regarding her androgynous appearance, was the topic of a podcast I recorded with Scrump and Dankula back in the day. I recorded a similar podcast about the Star Wars sequel trilogy, as a donation reward with a fan. But beyond just me, there's also Space Jam removing the overt sexuality of Lola Bunny to the anger of many furries, the absolutely cancerous Thundercats reboot, the new Ninja Turtles making yet another ginger character black, this time April O'Neil. Rugrats' recently announced reboot making Betty a lesbian. The absolute radioactive waste pile that was Star Trek Picard. The slightly better, but not really radioactive waste pile that was Star Trek Discovery. The complete dumpster fire that Game of Thrones turned out to be after they had to start actually writing their own series. The rapidly growing landfill of shitty woke video games. 
From Battlefield, to Battleborn, to Mass Effect Andromeda, to Fallout 76, to the entirety of Telltale games, to almost every single indie project out there, the supply of garbage media that compensates for a lack of talent and originality by injecting wokeness into it is endless. And yet, none of this explains why sometimes Get Woke, Go Broke is a rule in full effect, destroying projects and careers and sometimes entire legacies while other times the rule seems non-existent, as Star Wars and Star Trek and Captain Marvel slip on by, gaining profits and prestige despite being absolutely god-awful. When the angry video game nerd released a video stating that he refused to see or review Ghostbusters 2016, the entirety of woke internet descended on him. Cinemassacre YouTube critic refused to see Ghostbusters for dumb reasons. AVGN shows that he was probably one of the thousands of salty fans that made the Ghostbusters 2016 trailer one of the most disliked movie trailers in YouTube history. Brave, not sexist movie critic refuses to watch the new Ghostbusters. And of course, the story rapidly became about everything he'd ever done. The complicated legacy of the original angry video game nerd. And while the culture war was certainly in full swing, even back during 2016, AVGN's video didn't even reference it. It didn't talk about the encroaching wokeness versus misogynistic nerds divide. It certainly didn't mention Gamergate, Trump, Brexit, or the alt-right, even though every single fucking article tried to shoehorn that shit in whenever they could. Instead, AVGN focused on how the movie just didn't look good to him, and he didn't want to reward studios for making movies he thought were going to be bad. But, he made these comments in the context of a series of events happening within the film review and amateur filmmaker community that a lot of culture warriors tend to overlook when discussing Ghostbusters 2016. In 2009, Star Trek was revived from its sudden death into a new Apple Chrome movie series. And Terminator came back in a similar way as Terminator Salvation, intending but failing to start a new trilogy. The next year, Universal began a series of remakes, doing new versions of its classic black and white monster films, beginning in 2010 with The Wolfman, and then in 2020 following up with The Invisible Man. Also in 2010, A Nightmare on Elm Street received a reboot, as did The Karate Kid. 2011 saw a remake of Footloose, The Thing, and The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. 2012 gave us a remake of Total Recall, Red Dawn, and Judge Dredd. 2013 gave us Carrie and Old Boy. 2014 gave us Robocop and Maleficent. 2015 produced the steaming turd Terminator Genesis, which also failed to start a new trilogy. And why'd you have to spell Genesis that way? 2016 and 2018 both produced different versions of The Jungle Book. 2017 gave us The Beauty and the Beast and The Mummy. 2019 gave us Dumbo, Aladdin, The Lion King, Lady and the Tramp, Child's Play, and Terminator Dark Fate, that last one being most noteworthy for being the third failed attempt in a row to start a new Terminator trilogy. The entirety of the 2010s gave us the end of the Christopher Nolan Batman canon, plus a new canon in the failed DC Expanded Universe, plus another story based on 2019's Joker, plus the beginning of a fourth canon with our Pats as the Batman this time. Geez, you think that's enough? They've been trying and failing to revive Highlander with a reboot since 2008. I guess there really can only be one. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them came out to a widespread meh in 2016, and its sequel, The Crimes of Grindelwald, is the worst reviewed and least profitable Harry Potter installment to date. Oh, but wait, it's not Harry Potter, it's The Wizarding World now, since they're also doing a cinematic universe, just like everybody else's. Hell, have you seen there's going to be a second Marvel Cinematic Universe, this time owned by Sony? Yeah, this one's going to revolve around that other Spider-Man, and it's kicking off with the Venom movies. What a clusterfuck. We have been inundated by a complete and total lack of originality in the filmmaking space for nearly 15 years. Reboots, remakes, and side stories have been the name of the game since YouTube began. A lot of these movies are absolutely terrible. Some of them are good, but even if they're good, you can only enjoy the same story so many times. Films and video games are different in this regard. With a game, I don't care if I'm playing as the same character with the same story for each entry in the series if the gameplay is good. With a movie or a TV series, well, there's only so many times you can watch Batman's parents get shot, you know? This long list of films I just dumped on you, they span a wide range in both quality and profitability. And there's some correlation between those two variables, but it's still not exactly clear why sometimes a property gets woke and goes broke, and other times, progs join, gather coin. And there's also an inverse effect, too. People are so used to the get woke, go broke thing that there's often knee-jerk reactions to stuff that don't really qualify. Billy, the terminally online Spurg and former owner of One Angry Gamer, went absolutely nuts that Alucard had sex with a man in the Castlevania Netflix series, loudly exclaiming that Castlevania was going woke and surely would also be going broke, and that Netflix wanted to convert all the kids watching this mature audience's anime to homosexuality. The actual truth was, Alucard is a vampire who hates his vampiric nature, and so is quite lonely. In his loneliness, he's seduced by a pair of twins. No, it's not just a guy, there's also a girl who's involved and ends up getting sexually assaulted by them, as they intend to kill him and take his castle. Billy, in framing this as an OMG kids will see the gays in the TV way, 
ignored multiple layers of context, and ultimately became just like the woke scolds, forcing his politics into a place they didn't belong. So, what actually is Get Woke Go Broke? Or rather, if you were to pop the hood on it, what would you see? Because it cannot be exactly as advertised, there's too many contradictions for it to simply be Get Woke Go Broke. Consider Hollow Knight, an indie darling that came out in 2017 and one of my most favorite games of all time, personally. Before this game, Team Cherry were nobodies, known for absolutely nothing. Now, Hollow Knight has sold millions of copies across a wide variety of platforms, and the sequel, Silk Song, is one of the only games coming up that anybody's actually anticipating. And yet, Hollow Knight has LGBT representation that somebody like Billy would absolutely rage over, if he had known about it. The Nailsmith and Nailmaster Shio are a gay couple. The Grey Mourner is a lesbian who, as the name suggests, mourns her dead lover. The reason Billy never raged about it, and conversely, why Woke Scolds never praised it, is because Hollow Knight never makes a big deal about these characters. They don't wave pride flags, they don't have grand speeches about their gayness, they simply exist as characters in the world, acting as they would. Their gayness is secondary. The Nailsmith, as a character, is not known for being a gay rhino beetle. He's known for being a depressive recluse who upgrades your weapons. The Grey Mourner is not simply mourning her lesbian lover. She is an ancient being mourning the fall of the entire kingdom of Hallownest, having outlived everybody she's ever known and seen her home crumble to dust. And if you're thinking it's because the LGBT aspects of Hollow Knight are hidden, or that it's downplayed by them being goofy bugs and not human beings, Instead, consider Celeste. Launching in 2018, Celeste is a hard-as-balls platformer with extremely tight controls, excellent level design, and high-quality pixel art. And unlike Hollow Knight, Celeste does not hide its LGBT roots. Madeline is openly trans. And the game's principal creator, Matty Thorson, has directly stated that the game is about the coming out process, with the whole ascending the mountain and battling your evil self thing. In fact, after coming out in 2019, it became pretty obvious to everybody that Madeline is Matty Thorson. And despite the game being a giant self-serving wanking circle jerk, the gameplay is good, the music is good, the level design is good, and the game also sold millions of copies. Clearly, Get Woke Go Broke doesn't apply to Hollow Knight and Celeste, and the reason it doesn't is because they're quality games. Meanwhile, Battlefield 5 is absolutely considered a Get Woke Go Broke casualty, despite being a lot less woke and Celeste and selling a lot more copies, presumably because its overhead was so much larger and its failure so much more public. And of course, Get Woke Go Broke wasn't the death knell of Star Wars or Captain Marvel either, despite those not being quality movies. So it can't simply be a quality issue. Maybe it's because larger and more culturally influential properties are given a bit more slack by fans. I know Ghostbusters fans don't like to hear it, but as fun as the original Ghostbusters is, it's not on the same level of cultural relevance as the original Star Wars. Maybe one Ghostbusters stinker was enough to kill the franchise when you need multiple to kill Star Wars. On the other hand, we did get five Star Wars stinkers. On the other other hand, Star Wars was basically dead after stinker number five. If they had forged on with the Bubba Fett and Obi-Wan movies as originally advertised, they might have actually destroyed the franchise. The first season of The Mandalorian seems to have been the life support that Star Wars as a property so desperately needed. Same with Star Trek Picard. That might have been one of the worst fucking TV shows of all time, but its hook was literally the most beloved character of the most beloved show is back, so I'm not surprised it's still getting more seasons. Maybe it's because people are tired of subversion that serves nothing in the story, but simply done for the sake of subversion. There's a reason Subvert Your Expectations became a meme after the end of Game of Thrones in The Last Jedi. People complained about the new Dalmatians because Carilla Deville is iconic in her evil and her greed. When you subvert the icon, what's left of the story? It turns out, nothing. Same with the Powerpuff Girls and their innocence. Same with Luke Skywalker and his devotion to the Force. I'm not saying there's not a way to do subversion properly. There is, in fact, a very interesting possible story of an old, bitter Luke Skywalker who has given up the Jedi way and now lives as a hermit. But The Last Jedi didn't do the idea justice because it only valued the subversive moment, the gasp from the audience, and not the coherent aftermath of that event. That's the same thing with a lot of the properties we've discussed today. Birds of Prey was 100% built on the subversion without an aftermath model, and that's a big reason why it was so shit. The viewer was expected to identify with an objectively terrible main character who mistreats the reasonable people she comes across, and immediately overpowers any enemies she faces, making none of them seem like a threat, because girl power. This same framework also applies, to a lesser extent, to Wonder Woman 1984 and Captain Marvel, and helps explain why those movies are shitty too. I'm calling back to my identification with evil video here, where in order to be subversive, progressives often identify with clearly evil characters, because they oppose what our culture views as good and our culture as bad, so therefore evil must be good. Subversive. That being said, a movie the progs hate, that all the rightoid culture warriors adore, that also relies on this exact type of subversion, is Joker. Joker uses all the same tricks as Birds of Prey. 
Arthur is a terrible character. He does mistreat people he comes across, and his victories throughout the movie seem unrealistic and unearned. Yeah, the final interview with De Niro spawned a bunch of memes, but come on, there's no way that gun doesn't get discovered at some point by security or something before he gets on stage. The difference is, the subversion here serves a purpose. Like with Harley Quinn, we are actually meant to identify with Arthur, but unlike with Harley Quinn, it's not good that we identify with him. That's the point of the movie. We're invited to feel hopeless, not empowered through his actions. And Joker's messaging is all about mental health stigma, class conflict, shared struggle and solidarity, all things that should resonate with progressives. But instead, the woke scolds laughed at white male rage because my culture war. Make Joker a black woman with the exact same script and suddenly the movie becomes the greatest leftist movie of all time. And maybe that's the point too. Joker had a lot of woke going for it in the end, and it did the polar opposite of going broke. I think it's clear at this point that wokeness itself does not kill a property. It's my opinion that wokeness is a secondary effect, a byproduct of something else that might kill the property, but it's rarely the death blow. Let's return to Mass Effect. Remember that gigantic internet shitstorm over Mass Effect 3's terrible ending, and how the gamer outcry over it was so severe that EA had to promise to patch a new ending in? When game journals of today write about that event now, they call it a Gamergate before Gamergate, because I guess Gamergate was their fucking Vietnam. But let's dissect that event a little bit. Mass Effect 3 didn't contain any wokeness. In fact, it contained anti-wokeness. Joker, a human, and Garrus, a Turian, spend time on the Normandy telling each other edgy racist jokes about humans and Turians. Joker says that this type of banter allows people with genuine differences to come together as friends. Banter normalizes rather than otherizes. If a human can sit with a Turian and make fun of each other's performance in the first contact war over a drink, that does a lot to ensure there won't be a second war someday. Considering the state of free speech right now, this is probably the most anti-woke message a video game could present. Despite Mass Effect 3 containing no wokeness, and despite it doing pretty well in terms of sales in the end, it's still considered the weakest entry in the original trilogy, mainly due to its awful plot writing. And that's because a lot of the original Mass Effect staff had left Bioware. Junior writers, normally tasked with punching up quest dialogue, or writing incidental NPCs, were now in charge of the main bulk of the writing. Mass Effect and Dragon Age both suffered this fate, and not just with writing, but graphics and music as well. The people who had made Bioware what it was, who had created Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights and Coder and Mass Effect, had all moved on, and the new people were not up to the challenge. That seems to be another common thread across every example we've discussed today. On the creative side, the new people are not up to the challenge. Every show, every movie, every game mentioned in this video that has bankrupted their company, or closed their studio, or just considered to be shit by the fans, are made by people who are not up to the challenge. I began to notice this trend when I was listening to the writer's commentary videos of the final season of Game of Thrones. These people have no fucking clue how to write a show, and the minute they had to make their own original work, they instantly failed. Let me contrast these two approaches for you. 1. Axel Braun is a porn director. He specializes in creating porn of pop culture. Somebody asked him on Twitter why the costumes in his porn parodies are so good, and he replied with a simple, because I care. Look at this, this is for porn, guys. It doesn't need to look this accurate, it doesn't even need to look good, but when you care, it shows. And here's the second approach. Heavy Metal is an obscure Canadian 80s comic property that made the jump into a goofy B-movie about a silver-haired superhero with big boobs. The modern variant is... not that. When asked about it, the current owner of Heavy Metal magazine said, We don't want fans like you. We're good, thank you. And followed up with, Sounds like you have trouble reading and comprehending there, champ. Let's try this. We grew up. Sorry, you'll get there one day too. The former approach denotes a respect for the source material, including its quirks and its oddities, understanding that its rough edges and goofy moments are things that fans love about it. The latter approach denotes a lack of respect for the source material, viewing it as a name to be co-opted and used, rather than a property to be respected. I think this might be the core component. Ghostbusters 2016 sucked, but it sucked the hardest when it was shitting all over the original Ghostbusters while still reaping the benefits of using its name. The new Star Trek shows and movies have ranged from okay to downright abysmal, but have been consistently at their lowest point when blatantly contradicting pre-established lore. Star Wars went from captivating train wreck to downright unwatchable as soon as they decided everything about the old Star Wars was no longer worth adhering to. Again, you can go against the ethos of a series and make it good, even great, if you write an equally good reason. Otherwise, you're just writing garbage. You're subverting without writing a satisfying aftermath. And this is just a hunch from me, but I think it stems from a genuine hatred and jealousy of the properties these people have inherited. During the time period we've been discussing, the last five to ten years, new properties have also come out, and a lot of them have been shit. Big Mouth, Steven's Universe, Bojack, Stranger Things, Horizon Zero Dawn, No Man's Sky, Cyberpunk 2077, the list goes on. I don't expect to be fully agreed with for everything on this list, but I expect that most people will agree that most new properties are garbage. They contain nothing iconic and nothing with the potential to become iconic. They're largely self-referential and self-indulgent, and they seem to be the product of people who are also largely self-referential and self-indulgent. I think what's going on here 
is that a lot of these people had their dream movie or game or whatever, their dream story they wanted to tell. They go into the field of their choice hoping to tell their dream story. Those people who actually did tell that dream story created garbage properties. And those people who didn't, but instead got a hold of some beloved property, wanted to adapt their dream story to fit that property, regardless of how well it actually fit, and ruined the property in the process. I think this is why so many of the next generation of creators, when they get put in charge of a franchise with a huge pre-established fan base, inevitably bungle it up and then also blame the fans for their failure. They may have grew up with these franchises, but they wanted their dream to stand alongside these franchises. They didn't want to be told, no, just go make a new iteration of the original franchise. That's just my theory though. I don't have much to back it up. I'm just noticing the growing trend of people who don't have the experience, the talent, or the love of a property getting placed as the head of that property and subsequently destroying it. Sometimes woke shit is shoehorned in because the new head really believes it and really wanted to make their woke show, but this is all they got. Sometimes woke shit is used as a cover to distract from the gaping obvious lack of talent or experience. Oftentimes it's both. And during this type of takeover event, a property survives solely on the goodwill of fans, of how strong their love of the property is, of how many failures they're willing to tolerate before they move on. At the end of the day, get woke, go broke is not really a rule. Wokeness plus genuine talent can still create masterpieces, but wokeness is often a symptom of a larger problem. If there's no genuine talent, wokeness is the shield the creator hides behind. If there is a hatred for the property they're in charge of, wokeness is what's weaponized to destroy it. But wokeness itself, however politically detestable I might personally find it, is not the only variable that contributes to a property's failure. And there's also Fuller House. What the fuck were they thinking?